Hello, everyone, and uh, welcome to this Elvis's webinar on dynamic cell culture. My name is Lisa Moishnex, and I'm a Marie Curie Fellow at Elvis's. And first, I'll describe, so introduce physiological forces on the body. Next, I'll describe how and where to apply forces to cells and culture, with a particular focus on tension and shear. And lastly, I'll describe some biological applications that show some state-of-the-art examples of what can be done with dynamic cell culture, particularly compared to traditional and more commonly used static systems. So forces are abundant in the body. And in particular, native cell environments are crowded and dynamic. And these forces can come from every length scale. They can include large scale coordinated motions of walking or moving that put tension, torsion or compression on the cells in the body. Muscular contractions can also be involuntary, for example, peristalsis. Electrical pulses control the beating of the heart and the smoothing of blood down the arterial tree. And the circulation of fluid puts shear stress on the vessel walls. Hydrostatic pressure, in particular across the wall of the lung, helps in breathing. Whereas on the uh, scale of the smallest functional unit of the lung, the alveolar air sacs, surface tension is very important from helping these to stop collapsing. Now, uh, forces are also abundant at the cellular and molecular level, and they can come from a variety of sources, including migration of cells, cell division, and transport of solutes. So the early take home message here is that forces are abundant in the body and cells sense these forces. And this can trigger signaling cascades that can result in differences in gene expression, for example, that govern cell fate and function. So taking a closer look at physiological forces on a cellular level, we'll focus on normal forces, for example, tension and compression, where the force is applied normal to a surface. We'll also look at shear stress, where the force is applied tangential to a surface, for example, in the flow of blood. Um, yeah, uh, when blood flows through vessels, it, is, it exerts pressure on the vessel walls, and in particular on the endothelial cells lining the walls. Now, in long, straight, thin blood vessels, flow is usually laminar, and this means that viscous forces dominate over inertial, and this is described by a low Reynolds number. Forces and flow can also be pulsatile. And there's a different kind of flow called interstitial flow that doesn't occur inside blood vessels, but occurs in the porous interstitial networks of tissues around cells. And interstitial flow is very important in the function of many different organs, including the lymphatic system and bone. Now, geometry also plays a very large role in affecting flow profiles and shear stress in organs and tissues. Now, in particular, in the largest blood vessels and at points of geometric disruption, for example, bifurcations or branching points and at aortic bends, flow is turbulent. And this turbulent or chaotic flow results in a lower flow rate and lower shear stress on the vessel wall in this local location compared to the immediate surrounding tissue. And this has big implications in, for example, the formation of atherosclerotic plaques in cardiovascular disease. Another example where geometry plays a large role in flow profiles and shear stress is in the interstitial spaces of bone, where, for example, the smaller the pores, the larger the shear stress for a given flow rate. On the other hand, with larger pores and a lower flow rate, shear stress will be lower in these areas. And this has large implications in, for example, bone homeostasis and the tight coupling between bone formation and bone resorption. So how do you generate and control flow in your system? Well, in the body, the heart is what controls the flow of blood and the pumping through the circulatory system. In the lab, it's most commonly used syringe pumps and peristaltic pumps to control the flow of fluid. However, you can also use gravitational forces, for example, rocking platforms. And for better stability and response time, you can also use an electronic pressure controller, for example, the OB1 from Elderflow. The OB1 connects to a flow sensor that can have a feedback loop, and this allows the control of fluid in your system on the basis of pressure or on flow rate. 
Now using the ESI software, you can choose a flow profile of your choice through your system, whether that be steady or pulsatile, or even custom, for example, to mimic the heartbeat. And then using the OB1, it becomes quite straightforward to seed cells and perfuse media through your microfluidic device. For example, using the OB1, you can seed cells in solution into your microfluidic chip using a very low flow rate, and then apply a static hold to ensure that the cells have time to adhere. And after the cells have adhered, you can choose and apply the flow profile of your choice. Now, of course, the, the pressure controller doesn't just control the flow of liquid through your system. It can be used to apply tension or stretch to a membrane that the cells are sitting on. And this can be done by controlling the flow of pressurized air or vacuum. Now here are some uh, strategies for where to position your pneumatic channels and valves in your chip. The first example is the quake valve, named after Stephen Quake, whose lab first described this. Now in this diagram, the, the uh, valve is comprised of a fluid channel here in purple, and one, or in this case, more air channels in yellow. And when air is pushed through an air channel, it depresses the flow of liquid in the fluid channel. So you can use these as kind of on off switches to start or stop the flow of fluid, or you can program these sequentially to have a kind of pulsatile flow in the channel below. Now, force can also be applied directly to cells. And in this case, air or force is pushed through a small hole into an otherwise closed well of a trans well system. And here, the force goes straight onto the cells which are sitting on this membrane. And this is one of the early examples of a lung on chip with an air liquid interface. Now, force in the form of biaxial tension can also be applied to cells here in red on a membrane here in gray. And the membrane here is sitting on top of the pillar. And in this device, it's a two-part device, the bottom part is sized to fit into a microtiter plate. And by adding a vacuum in this bottom pneumatic chamber, you apply stress on the membrane, depressing it, uh, exerting force on the cells in multiple directions. Now, force can also be applied in a radial tensile manner. And this, again, is a lung-on-chip model. And it's a little bit more complicated than the previous model, because it involves two membranes, or uh, microdiaphragms in this case. Uh, the bottom uh, membrane here is a microdiaphragm mimic sitting on top of a pneumatic channel. And when pressure is added to this channel, it depresses the diaphragm, moving the liquid, transducing the force onto the upper membrane, which is a mimic of an air-liquid interface that the cells sit on. And this fifth example, also a lung on chip by the lab of Hu and Ingber, shows a very nice example of how you can add tensile stress and perfusion to the same chip at the same time. For example, in this chip, the two central stacked channels can be perfused with air and or liquid across the central membrane here that the cells are seated on. And the two flanking cha channels are vacuum channels. And when you apply vacuum to these channels, you stretch the membrane, thereby applying shear um, tension to the cells. So now I'll give you some uh, applications of dynamic cell culture in biology. And the first, probably most important and major application of being able to apply flow, whether that be laminar or pulsatile in your microfluidic cell culture system, is the ability to mimic a blood vessel. And this is the ability to mimic the flow of fluid. So nutrient exchange, uh, removal of waste, and importantly, the addition of shear stress to your system. Now, consequently, uh, researchers have started using these systems to look at physiological and disease-based states. And this is opening up the field of organ-on-chip technology, where specifically an individual function of an organ is selected to be replicated uh, on the level of a chip. And this allows researchers to look at cell interactions, cell behavior, the re release of biomolecules, and uh, the response to drugs, for example. And you can start to imagine a personalized medicine approach where a patient's own cells can be seeded and tested on these chips under dynamic conditions. Now, the ability to add flow also enables researchers to study inflammatory response. For example, the rolling and adhesion studies of neutrophils. 
the ability to add compressive or contractile stress opens up research in bone homeostasis, for example, in bone disease such as osteoporosis. It enables researchers to study vessel occlusion, for example, in atherosclerosis and cardiovascular disease. And it allows models of wound repair to be developed, for example, when fibroblasts contract to pull the surrounding tissue and close the wound. As we've just heard, the ability to add tensile stress enables membrane stretching in organ-on-chip systems, uh, thereby allowing study of the physiological organs that require uh, mechanical stretch for their function, whether that be the lung, the gut, even skin. And the ability to apply interstitial flow in this example, as a difference in hydrostatic pressure, modeled as a volume difference in two reservoirs opposite a central channel, enables uh, researchers to look at very complex systems, such as cancer metastasis and angiogenesis. So now I'll spend the last part of the talk describing three examples in more detail. The first being the lung on chip with uh, cyclic tensile stress. And Organ on chip technology in general enables the tissue specific functional features to be studied. And in the case of the lung, this is, for example, surfactant production, uh, immune responses, modeling disease states, for example, edema in the lung or COVID 19 pneumonia, and testing the effect of drugs. And also, we can look at toxicity of nanoparticles, for example, in the air we breathe with this system. Now, this is the, the state-of-the-art lung-on-chip system by the lab of Hu and Ingber. And the researchers populated the membrane with a monolayer of airway epithelial cells on the top and vascular endothelial cells on the bottom layer. And they applied 10% mechanical stretch across the membrane. Next, they perfused the vascular channel, including with neutrophils, which are immune cells. And they watched as the immune cell, uh, the neutrophils, could bind to the vascular endothelial cells uh, as they were activated by the presence of E. coli, which had been added in the upper chamber. The neutrophils could bind the, the lower cells, cross the membrane, and then once in the airway side, find the E. coli, which are here staining in green, and engulf them in an immune response. Another example of this lung on chip uh, used for an application here is in the stress response of the airway cells. So here, the researchers used silicon nanoparticles as the agonist and uh, measured the ROS production by the epithelial cells in the presence of strain as compared to no or little ROS production in the absence of strain. The researchers also showed that nanoparticles were able to cross, translocate the membrane uh, into the vascular channel with greater efficiency in the presence of strain than in the absence of strain. So the next example I'll describe is in blood vessel formation and the effect of flow and shear stress. Now there are two main ways the blood vessels can form. The first is by vasculogenesis or from progenitor cells. And in this study, researchers used a chip with the, the design that included a central channel made up of three interconnected diamonds. And they filled the diamonds with a fibrin gel that was also that also included endothelial cells and fibroblasts. And there are two channels, one on either side, that media was flowed through and growth factors. And on one of these channels, the flow rate was higher to mimic arterial flow. And on the other channel, on the other side, the flow rate was lower to mimic venous flow. And the researchers were able to model the flow profile of fluid through these interconnected channels. They were able to model the hydrostatic pressure differences and the pressure gradient across the channel. And together, the fluid flow profiles and pressure gradient, as determined by very specific geometry, were sufficient to be able to form um, microvasculature that could be perfused. The second type of vessel formation is angiogenesis, or the sprouting of vessels from existing vessels. And this is a similar type of uh, microfluidic setup in where the two central channels are filled with a fibrin gel. The red channel here, uh, endothelial cells were allowed to form a vascular network. In the purple channels flanking, uh, media was perfused. And in the outside channels in green, were seeded with fibroblasts that released an angiogenic factor. 
and a hydrostatic pressure gradient was applied across the system between the two outside channels using a difference in volume. And importantly, the pressure was applied in one direction and then in the other direction. Now, the researchers first noticed that under static conditions, angiogenic sprouting did occur. However, in the presence of flow, a significantly increased number of angiogenic sprouts were observed. And the second thing they noticed was that the angiogenic sprouts um, were affected by the direction of hydrostatic flow. For example, in one direction, uh, the sprouts were uh, promoted, and when the flow is in the other direction, uh, sprouts were not promoted. Now, these two studies both were done and carried out in the context of cancer vascularization. For example, uh, in particular, the higher interstitial pressure from the tissue towards the blood vessel that drives the vascularization of tumors. And now, while the exact mechanisms are not yet known, this is a really neat example that shows uh, the power of dynamic cell culture and where the fields can be going. So this leads into my third and final example, which is cancer metastasis. So as we've just heard, solid tumors are highly vascularized and the vasculature is leaky and the lymphatic drainage is also reduced. So this results in an increase in interstitial flow and pressure buildup across the tumor. Now the tumor itself is also extremely dense and has its own uh, pressure gradient that's high in the center and flows out towards the edge of the tumor. And together this contributes to the cancers invading nearby tissue and also individual cancer cells breaking off and crossing into the bloodstream. And this is called intravasation. Intravasation can be modeled in a microfluidic dynamic cell culture system using, for example, a model chip system here, which has multiple channels uh, with a gel channel separating a tumor and blood channel. Now researchers can look at the movement, migration of tumor cells in the interaction of tumor cells with endothelial and other cells. But once the tumor uh, cells are in the circulation, they circulate through the body dependent on flow rate, and then they arrest or stop, either when they get stuck in small vessels or when the blood flow, uh, flow rate decreases substantially and the adhesion strength of the tumor cells to the endothelial cell wall increases above that of the shear uh, stress. And this step can also be modeled on microfluidic system with dynamic cell culture and very recently has been modeled as a sort of cell rolling and adhesion assay where the researchers used monolayer of endothelial cells and tumor cells in perfusion. And what the researchers showed was that endothelial cells remodeling around the adhered tumor cells scales with flow velocity. And in particular, it's very dependent on the shear stress level in the vessel. Now, when endothelial cells remodel completely around the tumor cell, the tumor cell can extravasate or exit the, uh, the vessel and is free to form a secondary metastasis far from the original tumor. So I hope with this, I've shown you uh, some of the advantages of dynamic cell culture and shown you uh, how that can be exciting to enhance the state of the art for several and many biological applications. Please find the references used to make this presentation here, including a shear stress calculator. And if you have any questions or comments, please feel free to leave them below. We always like hearing from you and thanks for listening.